Welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore Podcast. I'm Mark Royce, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, we are going to explore one of the most terrifying, spine-chilling, eerie, and also most common of folkloric subjects, and that is death omens. More specifically, we are going to look at the phantom funerals of Wales. The ghostly processions that walk the dark roads at night, holding aloft a coffin, inside of which is a person who, at that moment in time at least, is still alive. And so, to begin at the beginning, and folklore tells us that, Among the most important of the superstitions of Wales are the death portents and omens. And this is perhaps more or less true of every country. About a generation or two ago, there were to be found almost in every parish some old people who could tell beforehand when a death was going to take place. And even in the present day, we hear of an old man or an old woman here and there possessing or supposed to possess an insight of this kind into the future. So folklore is telling us that not just in Wales, around the world, as recently as the early 20th century and possibly still today, most parishes, most villages around the land had some old man or old woman who could predict the future. But not in a good way, not in a nice way. They couldn't predict the lottery numbers. Well, maybe they could do that as well. But they could certainly predict if there was going to be a death and maybe even who exactly was going to die. And in one example recorded in the early 1900s, a Mrs. Lloyd from Fanon Vagrai in Llangunog, Carmarthenshire, recalled how an old man living there named Thomas Harry's always foretold every death in the parish as he possessed second sight. And on one occasion, a John Thomas from Pentre, who worked about the farms, called in to see Thomas Harry's one day on his way home. He was in good health then, but on the very next day he was very ill and soon died. Harry's had foretold the death of the poor man some days before he was taken ill. He had also foretold the death of one Howells, who was buried at Ebenezer Chapel, and of an old woman known as Rassi of Moilrevach, as well as the death of one Thomas Thomas about 35 years ago. So, going by that list of names, he had a pretty good record of predicted deaths. And, as a result, to quote, people were almost frightened to see Harry's, as he often foretold the death of someone or other, and his predictions were always correct. Now, moving on to the phantom funerals themselves, or toily as they are known in Welsh, T-O-I-L-I. And we are told that with the exception of the corpse candle, and I'll be looking at those in more detail soon as well, but with the exception of the corpse candle, the most prominent death portent is the toily, or spirit funeral, a kind of shadowy funeral which foretold the real one. In the very north of Cardiganshire, we are told, as the counties were back then, in the very north of Cardiganshire, such apparitions are known as Tiley, which means family in Welsh, which is quite a creepy name for a phantom funeral. Here comes the family. But to continue, they also had a different name in North Pembrokeshire, so folklore tells us, which is more bizarre than than strange this time. It was called Kravishkin, which, to the best of my knowledge, is a word for crustaceans, for shrimps, maybe. And what connection that has with phantom funerals, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we'll find out at some point on this episode. But anyway, for the most part, in most parts of Wales who were familiar with this phenomena, it was called the toily in the Welsh language. And in the English language, it might be called a phantom or a spirit funeral. And in one such case, to quote, 
There are tales of phantom funerals all over the Diocese of St. David's, and the following account of a 20th century phantom funeral in Pembrokeshire is interesting as the informant himself, the witness himself, saw this phantom funeral with his own eyes. This hasn't been passed on from friend of a friend of a friend. This is a first-hand account from a man in Pembrokeshire who witnessed the strange apparition or a foreshadowing of a funeral which actually took place soon afterwards. And it goes like this. A young man who lives in the Gwine Valley between Pont Vine and Fishguard informed me in the autumn of 1905 that he had just seen a phantom or spirit funeral only a few weeks previously. A friend of his, a young porter at a railway station in the neighbourhood of Cardiff, had come home ill to his native place in Pembrokeshire, and his friend, my informant, one night sat up by his bedside all night. About three o'clock in the morning, the patient was so seriously ill that my informant, in alarm, hurried to call the father of the poor sufferer to come and see him as the old man lived in a small cottage close by. As soon as he went out through the door into the open air, to his great astonishment, he found himself in a large crowd of people, and there was a coffin resting on some chairs ready to be placed on the bier. And the whole scene, as it were, presented a funeral procession, ready to convey the dead to the grave. When the young man attempted to proceed on his way, the procession also proceeded, or moved on in the same direction, so that he found himself still mixed up in this big crowd. So, to recap quickly, this young man dashes out of the house to go and tell the father of his friend that his son is seriously ill and needs to come and see him now. Instead, he finds himself mixed up in this huge group of people outside the house who curiously have a coffin with them. And when he tries to get through them, to get past them, they walk with him. They walk in the same direction as the young man. And to continue, after going on in this manner for about a 100 yards, he managed to draw one side from the crowd and soon reached the house of his sick friend's father and nearly fainted when he got there. Three days after the vision, the seer's friend died, and on the day of the funeral, the young man noticed that the crowd stood in front of the house and the coffin resting on the chairs exactly as he had seen in the apparition. And that is a very handy, a very creepy, but a very handy story to start with, because that story contains all of the key elements that crop up again and again in these phantom funeral sightings. They are a vision of a funeral that will soon play out for real and which spells the death, which spells the imminent end for one unfortunate member of the parish. But we're not quite finished yet, just quickly to wrap up that tale. And my informant, who had seen the phantom funeral, was so terrified, even at the time when I saw him all those years afterwards, that he was too much afraid to go out at night. And as a final footnote to that tale, the folklorist records that this man who was so terrified he didn't even want to leave the house only managed to get that tale from him because he was accompanied by a clergyman. He needed the reassurance of the church just to utter those words aloud. Now, moving on to our next account of a phantom funeral, and this one comes courtesy of the Reverend John Phillips, vicar of Llankinvelin in North Cardiganshire, again as it was. But the events that follow took place in the adjoining county of Carmarthenshire, and more specifically in the village of Keelacombe. And we are told that though more than 30 years have run their course since the incident, which is to be described here occurred Still, the impression which is left on the writer's mind was so vivid 
and lasting that he finds not the slightest difficulty in recalling the minutest detail at the present moment. Some experiences are so impressive that time itself seems powerless to efface them from the memory, and of such the following appears to be an instance. So, an ominous start to this tale, whatever happened, whatever has haunted him for decades, is very much imprinted on his mind. And, to continue, it happened in the early spring, just when the days were perceptibly lengthening and a balmy feeling was creeping into the air, and a glad sense of hope was throbbing throughout the whole of nature. A boy of ten, or maybe a couple of years younger, tired out after a hard day of play and pleasure, sat resting on a log near a lonely house in a sparsely populated district. What could possibly go wrong near a lonely house in a sparsely populated district? And as he sat, he gazed down a long stretch of white and dusty road leading away past the house. As a rule, few and far between would be the travellers who used that unfrequented road. Nobody ever used it. The sole exception would be on a Sunday, when perhaps a dozen or more so neighbours would be seen wending their way to or from the nearest place of worship. So the only time you saw people were on a Sunday when the good Christian folk were going to and from church or chapel or wherever they worshipped. And as such, intense, therefore, was the boy's surprise when, on this weekday, his eyes discerned a goodly company turning the corner in the distance and proceeding in an orderly procession along the stretch of straight road which his vantage ground commanded. So this boy in this lonely spot where he never sees a soul has just seen a lot of souls coming towards him. They've turned the corner, they're walking along the path, and he watched it keenly and wondered greatly. Never had he seen such a crowd on that particular road. As the people drew nearer and nearer, something of solemnity in their orderly and silent manner struck on the watcher's imagination, but no sense of anything akin to the supernatural obsessed his mind for a second. So while it was strange to see all these people on this path, it was not supernaturally strange, at the moment at least, anyway. And also, he couldn't fail but to notice that for such a large assemblage, it was remarkably noiseless. They made no sound. And 20 yards more or less from where the youthful watcher sat, a footpath leading over a piece of wet and barren land joined the road. This path, which could be traversed only in dry weather, terminated half a mile away at the door of a solitary cottage inhabited by a farmhand named Williams, who dwelt there with his wife and several young children. When the crowd arrived at the spot where the path ran on to the road, there seemed to be a momentary hesitation, and then the procession left the road and took to that footpath. The watcher strained every nerve in an effort to recognise someone or other in the crowd, but though there was something strangely familiar about it all, there was also something so dim and shadowy as to preclude the possibility of knowing anyone with certainty. But as the tail end of the procession curved round to gain the path, something he did observe which caused a thrill, for the last man carried high on their shoulders a beer. But it was an empty beer. And just to clarify quickly, that is, of course, a funeral beer. B-I-E-R beer. He wasn't holding aloft 
a pint of beer. Although that isn't an uncommon sight either in Wales, especially on match days. But anyway, back to the account. And there's something about these people. He can't, he can't quite work it out. He can't quite put his finger on it. But he, he recognises them, but he doesn't quite know exactly who they are. Their, their, their faces, it's just out of view. It's just out of focus. It's just in a bit of shadow. And for some bizarre reason, they also happen to be carrying an empty funeral beer. And they are very off onto this path that you can only traverse in the dry weather. If it starts raining, this place becomes impassable. But they veered off the road. And to continue, soon as the multitude was out of sight, the boy rushed to the house and related his curious experience. No thought of anything weird and uncanny had so far crossed his mind, and his one desire at the time was to gain some information as to where the people were bound for. So he rushes back, he tells everyone what he's seen, he wants to know what's going on, and neither could he then understand the manifest consternation and the hushed awe which fell upon his hearers as he unfolded his tale. Among these there happened to be a visitor, an old dame of a class well known in many parts of rural Wales in those days, which I think is a polite folklorist way of saying this woman was a bit of a busybody, a bit of a gossip, and it was her habit to stroll from farm to farm along the countryside, regaling the housewives with the latest gossip. In return, she would be sure of a meal and also something to carry home in her wallet. Naturally, such a character would be shrewd and keen, knowing well not only what tales would suit her company, but also the truth or otherwise of any tales which she herself might be a listener to. So this woman was a good detector of lies, as it were. She was a human lie detector, just who you need when it comes to fantastical ghost stories like this one. And in addition, the old dame in question was generally supposed to be immune from all fear and cared not how far from home she might be when the shades of night overtook her. On the present occasion, although a few minutes before she had been on the point of starting, she was ready to leave, and indeed only waiting to be handed her usual dole of charity, no sooner had she heard the lad's strange tale that she flatly declared that no power on earth could move her to travel an inch further that evening. And so, at the expense of much inconvenience to the household, a bed had to be prepared for her. And if that isn't a sign that something bad is going on, nothing is. The woman who knows no fear suddenly knows fear. She's too scared to go out of that home that night. However, she started early on the following morning, and long before noon, owing mainly to her assiduous diligence, the news had travelled far and near. She really was a good gossip. The news had travelled far and near that a phantom funeral had been seen on the previous evening. Her tale made a deep impression throughout the countryside. Those prone to superstition, and it must be confessed, there were many, lent a ready year. Now, it should also be said that a few, and these prided themselves on their common sense, doubted. And the latter class were not slow to point out what they considered to be a fatal flaw in the evidence. This supposed funeral was travelling in a direction which led away from the churchyard. They were going the wrong way. Had it been going down the road instead of up, they argued, then there might be something in it. Then again, it didn't go entirely in a straight line. It stopped at that path, that impassable path at times, and seemed to veer off. And funerals keep to the high roads. And this path could not by any stretch of the imagination be said to lead to any burial grounds. Now, overall, this seemed a reasonable view to take. 
And as one day succeeded the other without anything unusual happening, the excitement cooled down. And whether you believed in the folklore or not, this all makes sense. As with our previous example, the whole point of the phantom funerals were that they walked in exactly the same direction as a real funeral would a few days later. And after a few days had passed and no funeral had walked that way, plus they were walking in the wrong direction Anyway, it all sounded a bit far-fetched, a little bit unlikely, but to return to our tale, however, within a few weeks, Williams, who lived in that cottage across the marsh, was taken ill. At first, it was thought that he had contracted a chill, and it was hoped that he would soon be well again. The nearest medical man lived six miles away, and that caused further delay. On the fifth day, the doctor came, but he came to find that it was too late for his skill to be of any avail. A glance at the patient had satisfied him that it was a case of double pneumonia and that the end was rapidly approaching. A few hours later, and Williams had drawn his last breath. Three days more, and the funeral took place. As is the custom in country places, the neighbours from far and near attended, and on their way, a group of men called at the burial place for the beer. This group was joined by others, so that long before the house of mourning was reached, the procession was a large one. He was a popular man. They were picking up people as they walked there. It travelled up the long stretch of road where the lad had watched the mysterious crowd in the twilight six weeks before. The same lad watched again. And when the procession reached the point where the footpath branched across the fields, the man who acted as leader stopped and raised his hand while the procession hesitated for a moment. Then, looking at his watch, the leader spoke in low, clear tones. Men, said he, it is getting late. If we go round by the road, it will get very late. We will take the path. He led the way. And as his followers swept round the curve, the lad saw the last four men carried on their shoulders an empty beer. It was being taken to fetch his body. And so, the death omen, the phantom funeral, did indeed prove to be true. But in this case, the aspect of the funeral the boy saw was not the men carrying the body to be buried in the ground. Rather, they were going to pick up the body beforehand. And while we only have the testimony of this young boy who was an older man at the time of recalling it, it just goes to show that you should never doubt the death omens of Wales. And in theory, if he saw them at this particular part, having picked up the body, other people might have seen them later on their route as they took poor William to his final resting place. And on that cheerful note, we have reached the end of another episode of the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, this is the first of a semi-regular series I'll be doing, investigating the various kind of terrifying death omens that were said to predict the end of a life in Wales. The next one coming up in a few episodes' time is going to be Corpse Candles, a subject I've spoken about a lot on this podcast, but I'll be dedicating an entire episode looking specifically at the Corpse Candles. And if you don't want to miss that episode or any of the other episodes I've got coming up and you haven't already, please consider hitting the subscribe button. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can treat me to a coffee via my website. Every coffee you buy helps keep this podcast on the air and is very much appreciated. Or if you'd like to support the podcast for free, you can always just leave a nice review, give it a nice thumbs up, five stars, whatever the options are for being nice on whatever platform you are consuming this on, or just 
shout about it and tell the world on social media. And talking about social media, if you want more ghosts and folklore, you can follow me on all of the main social media platforms. And as well as a podcast, I've also written a number of books on similar weird and wonderful subjects, including Paranormal Wales and Ghosts of Wales, which are available from all good bookshops, offline and on. All of which just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian Amprando. I've been Mark Reese. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. And remember, if you do see some strange, shadowy figures carrying a coffin around and a funeral beer, maybe, not a pint of beer, Even if they're going in the total opposite direction to the graveyard, they could be nowhere near the graveyard. They could be walking around the supermarket with it. Nevertheless, wherever you see them, I would take that omen seriously. Until next time, North Star. (laughs) 